our, ne our next speaker, uh, keeping in the tradition of other great scholars like Murray Rothbard is a, a real scholar of just tremendous range. History, economics, politics, a uh, two-time best-selling author, currently the author of Meltdown, which is a number one New York Times bestseller, and just a, a, a complete gem. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Tom Woods. Thank you guys, ladies and gentlemen, thank you Jesse. Um, Meltdown was a New York Times bestseller, it did not get to number one, however, you know, you can always, you know, on your way out, you can try. Well, it's a great honor to be here and to speak at an event in which we are celebrating Ron Paul, and the only time I don't listen to Ron Paul is when he says not to talk about him, so I am going to say a, a brief word. Um, one of the things I like most about him is that he doesn't believe what he was taught in the seventh grade. So he doesn't believe all the propaganda that the drones in our drone factories are taught day in and day out. And the, result, the resulting personality type is one that more or less assumes that the government is there for his own good and that, that really if left to ourselves we'd all crumble into uh, anarchy. Well, that just terrible. But so for example, I think we all know how the typical American history textbook tells a story, don't we? Uh, the, first, the, the, the first part would be that um, for a long time we had people who believed in something called states' rights or the Tenth Amendment or local self-government. These were all stupid evil people, you know. These were all people who for some reason didn't trust their overlords in Washington and thought that they ought to control their own affairs. No, these were bad people and really all they were interested in was slavery and segregation. There's no reason other than that that anyone could possibly support the powers of the states. Well, it turns out if you look in American history, you find that people use the concepts of states' rights in order to defend free speech, to defend peace, to defend free trade, and in fact, to defend the fight against slavery. In fact, Thomas Jefferson in 1798 said the unsayable when he drafted the Kentucky resolutions and said the federal government has only the powers granted to it, the states retain all powers not granted to it, and if that federal government tries to exercise a power it hasn't been given, then the states should refuse to enforce it and nullify that law, said Jefferson. Now, of course, if you try to put this point of view forth, you know, well, you're some kind of an extremist, there's something the matter with you, maybe you need some sort of psychological evaluation. Well, that's when I always like to remind our, our opponents that this was, after all, Thomas freaking Jefferson. I mean, it's not like I just pulled this out of... Right? That they don't want. That they do not want. They don't want you to know that Thomas Jefferson thought that or that for 10 years people had been thinking things like that ever since the Virginia Ratifying Convention promised Virginians that that new federal government cannot go beyond the powers that according to the Virginia Ratifying Convention were expressly delegated to it so don't worry that the federal government will misuse the general welfare clause or anything like that so people were assured that Virginia would be exonerated from it if this federal government should go beyond its legitimate powers. Now, as I say, today, while well, this is, you know, no one could possibly hold a view like that, well, except Thomas Jefferson and the entire Virginia political tradition. But this is, we cannot allow the ears of our gentle little children to be soiled with these, these ideas. No, sir, this is subversive. We can't give people ideas. No, 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 no. You just do what the Harvard PhDs in Washington want you to do, just shut your mouths, and there is no way to resist them. That, that's the story we get told. So states' rights is terrible. There's no reason you'd ever have recourse to it. Or secondly, this is one of my favorites. I think we all learned this. In the 19th century, we had a free market economy in which the economy was totally dominated by evil monopolists who exploited everybody, and they jacked prices up, and, they, and everybody was working for three cents an hour, and people had to crawl around eating dirt and searching for for worms for sustenance. And the economy was dominated by short little men with white mustaches carrying around sacks of money with dollar signs on them. I think we all got this, right? 
Now, I think the, the lesson here is <laughs> not too subtle. Well, obviously, your wise overlords need to come rescue the, you from this terrible, terrible outcome. Well, again, this is also a whole lot of propaganda, and I won't bore this, this room with the details, but the bottom line is this is just total nonsense. If you look at people like Andrew Carnegie, I don't think he's a bad guy. If steel rails go down by 90% in price, that pretty much makes everything cheaper, makes our lives easier. Why am I supposed to be more afraid of him than I am of the freaking U.S. president who has control over the military and every other aspect of the U.S. government? Why am I supposed to be afraid of some guy who makes steel? Why is that the big enemy? But in the, but in the schools, that's what you're taught. This is a terrible old private sector, and all these public-spirited officials who are there for the common good are going to protect you from them. Or another favorite, the Federal Reserve System. Well, that was created to stabilize the economy, right? Smooth out business cycles, give us a stable currency, be a lender of last resort. Okay, so it can do one thing, yeah. <laughs> but in fact, if anything, I'm overstating the case because I bet you most of us in school never heard anything about the Federal Reserve one way or the other, right? It's not that we heard some propaganda view. We didn't hear a thing, right? And if you raise it with your teacher, well, immediately you're going to change the subject because the teacher has no idea what on God's green earth you are talking about. However, however, if you were in the advanced class, there's a chance that you did get at least some mention of the Federal Reserve, but again, it's portrayed, and I've seen it portrayed in textbooks, as a wonderful device by which the experts apply scientific management to the supply of money. And this is how we prevent depressions from occurring. Now, of course, we try to pass over that, that little bump that 16 years after the Federal Reserve Act, you know, we got the beginning of the um, Great Depression. So we're supposed to think, oh, sorry, sorry, everybody, sorry. Just a little mistake there, sorry. We're just getting our feet wet here. Gave you the worst depression in all of American history. Sorry about that. Sorry. And so we get told that without the Fed, think of what we'd have. We'd have the terrible 19th century when we had all these financial panics, right? And good thing we have the Fed to rescue us from that. So now, again, what's the lesson here? Well, without our wise overlords in charge of the money supply, well, you know, again, we'd all be in terrible shape and this and that. Well, again, with a crowd like this, I don't want to bore you about 19th century financial panics, but if you look at them, they're pretty much all caused by the, pretty much the same causes. I mean, there is no Federal Reserve System at that time, but there are crummy government-established national banks, there are bank bailouts, implicit and explicit. And in fact, we're told that in the 1870s, we had the Long Depression. Ooh, that's supposed to make us think, oh, we don't want another Long Depression, so we better have a gigantic Fed to help us get out of it. Well, it turns out that Economic historians don't even believe there was a long depression anymore. They actually now believe that in 1873 you had a little recession, and then the rest of the decade was actually one of the most, combined with the 1880s, one of the most prosperous periods in all of American history, by all the metrics you can measure it by. And one of the reasons people thought we had a depression was that we've all been propagandized into believing that if prices fall, this is the worst outcome imaginable, right? <laughs> falling prices, we can't have that. Well, we had falling prices, 3.8% a year during the 1870s. People thought, oh my goodness, uh, commentators later thought this must have been a terrible depression. As a matter of fact, consumers kind of liked prices going down 3.8% a year. I don't think... I don't think a lot of you buy like a new computer product and then you go up to the register and find out actually the product is on sale, it's even less. I don't think you indignantly say, well now wait a minute, there's no way I'm paying less for this. That would be deflation. I can't let that happen. Before you know it, we'll have a deflationary spiral and we'll all be back to crawling around searching for worms. We can't have that. No, 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 no. But this is what we get taught and it's complete 100% propaganda. Or then, my so last one I'll, I'll, I'll talk about before moving on to other things. The New Deal and the Great Depression, okay, we all heard that we had the Great Depression and then we had stupid old Herbert Hoover, big old Herbert Hoover, who was too much of a doofus to do anything about the Great Depression and because of him it just got worse and worse and then FDR came in and magically did, did things that got us out of it and then even if you don't accept that, well, World War II got us out of it because if you build a lot of things that you're then going to blow up, this will make you wealthy. 